you and I would like to welcome you to Team Canada Champion Chats live from the Canadian Olympic Experience in Montreal. Can we just start this afternoon by getting a big big cheer from everyone in our schools all the way across Canada? Ready? On the count of three. One, two, three. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Thanks, guys. I am so excited to have you all here tuning in and thrilled to be your host for today's chat. For the next 45 minutes, we'll be talking about what it means to be a champion and hearing from our incredible panel of athletes about how they use goal setting, perseverance, and feedback to be successful in both the personal and professional lives. And uh, we're also going to take questions from our Team Canada Champion Chats teachers. So really looking forward to that. Uh, we would love to hear how you, the viewers, are enjoying the chat. So don't forget to share with us on social media using the hashtag Be a Champion. Uh, I guess I should introduce myself once again. I'm Tessa Virtue. My notes say three time Olympic medalist, but I'm pretty sure it's five. <laughs> and I've been a proud representative of Team Canada for over a decade with my skating partner, Scott Moyer, whom some of you may know. I'd like to now pass over to our athletes to introduce themselves. And I know that there'll be some familiar faces to many of you who have completed the awesome Team Canada Champion Chats lesson plans, but we'll take a moment to say hi and uh, introduce our excellent Olympic and Paralympic athletes joining us today. Let's start with you, Evan. I'm Evan Dunkey, Olympic race walker from Richmond, British Columbia. I'm so excited to be here today. I'm so jealous of all of you because when I was a nine-year-old boy growing up, dreaming of going to the games, I would have failed for experience like this. So I'm so excited to be here. I'm so jealous. I'm going to have so much fun today. Well, we're sure to have fun. Thanks, Evan. Let's go over to you, Priscilla. Hey everyone, my name is Priscilla Dunye. I'm a 2016 Paralympian in the sport of judo, and I'm thrilled to be with you guys today. And I also would love to have this opportunity as a kid. So I'm excited for you guys, and can't wait to hear your questions. Oh, great to have you, Priscilla. Thanks for joining us. How about you, Neville? Hi everyone, Neville right here. I'm Olympian in the sport of bobsleigh for their former sprinter and uh, Edmontonian. I'm really excited and glad to be here with you all as well. Thanks, <laughs> Last but not least, uh, over to you, Josh. Thanks, Tessa. Hi, everybody. My name is Josh Duick. I am a two-time Paralympic athlete, three-time medalist, and grew up in a really small town called Kimberly, BC. And like the rest of the crew, I've got this sense of joy for you to have this opportunity to uh, dive into some really great questions with all of us athletes. So true. Thanks, Josh. And a big thank you to all of our athletes for joining us here today. I also want to give a shout out once again to the fantastic Canadian Olympic experience right here in Montreal that is hosting us. It is such a cool place. I, I hope you all get to visit someday. Um, and, you know, before we get started on our discussion here, Let's check in with uh, one of our schools, Marion Carson School. How are you doing over there? <laughs> Shall we kick things off with Miss Lowe's grade three class? And I believe you have a question for me. Hello, Tessa. My name is Jane, and the question that I have today for you is what was the biggest sacrifice you had to make to become an Olympian? 
Good question. A really good question about the biggest sacrifices that I've had to make to become an Olympian. You know, there were many along the way. I think anything worthwhile and anything meaningful and significant to you requires sacrifice. And one of them was moving away from my friends and family, moving away from home when I was just 13 years old. Um, another was just the, the regimented training schedule required of pursuing an Olympic sport. Um, I was up at 5 a.m. every day, which meant an early bedtime, and I was saying no to a lot of social activities, um, unfortunately. But that just meant that I had to be a little more careful about the network of people I surrounded myself with, people who supported me and people who really understood what I was working towards. I think later in life, I missed out on going um, to school in the regular kind of university sense, and I always felt like that was a sacrifice. But I tried to maintain the sense of, goals. So I knew what I was working towards and suddenly those sacrifices became just simple choices. Um, it was all on this quest to do something extraordinary. And to me, those sacrifices were worthwhile because it, it led me somewhere that um, made me realize the joy was really in, in the hard work. So great question. Thank you so much for that. Today, I mean, in general, General, we're going to be talking about what it means to be a champion. So how you can set goals, persevere, and receive feedback in order to be the best that you can be. And to me, being a champion is just that. It's pushing yourself to the limits, um, exploring your limitless potential, and trying to do everything to your maximum capacity, whatever that may be. And I think being a champion is rising to the occasion in every facet of your life. So that's school, community, family, friends, sport. Um, it could be also other hobbies like theater or art. And I think, well, you know, I'm curious to hear what our, what our other athletes have to say about being a champion because they can certainly speak to that. Um, Evan, do you want to take this one? Absolutely. Thank you, Tessa. And I think uh, we had some, some mic issues before, so I'm going to just reintroduce myself for those that don't read lips. Uh, my name is Evan Dunphy. I'm a Canadian Olympic race walker from Richmond, British Columbia. Uh, I'm, I'm so excited to be here and chat to you guys. And, uh, you know, for me, being a champion means setting really, really big goals in, in whatever it is you love. It, you know, for, for us here today, it was sport. But, uh, you know, for, for you, it might not be sport. It might be teaching or it might be music or, or whatever it is. Just being a champion means setting those really big goals and then chasing after them with all your heart putting every ounce of energy you have into achieving those goals. And, and the biggest part about being a champion is that at a certain point, once you've gotten along that journey a little bit and, and learned these valuable lessons and, and transformed and, and grown as a person, being a champion really means turning around and using those skills that you've, you've gained and, and giving them back to the next generation and, and paying it forward. Uh, I think that's a really big part about being a champion is, is using your platform to develop by chasing your goals and then turning around and helping others with those skills. Uh, so for me, that's that's you know very personal what I try to do. And I, I think I, I speak for a lot of the athletes when we say that's what we really try to do uh, with, with our voice and, and our platform is to to give back a little bit and, and to use our skills to hopefully inspire you guys. Evan, and you really are inspiring. I think it's, it is so much more about it's more than just the medals. It's more than the podiums. It's it's about giving back, as you say, and hopefully inspiring the next generation. Um, in order to be a champion, you want to make sure that you're you're setting yourself up for success in every way possible. And the best way to do this um, is to start by setting a goal. So Neville, this question is for you. Why do you think goals are important? And what is it that you're working towards currently? So why do I think goals are important and what goals have I set for myself currently? Um, goals are important because they provide you with feedback, um, information, and direction. Um, they act as a, a blueprint to help you achieve your goals. And just as important as goals are, we have to focus on the process because it's the process that's going to get us to achieve our goals. And for myself, currently, um, I'm working on you know developing myself as a performance therapist and a speaker. And um, I found that, you know, I have to really focus on the process and developing that learning from my environment and from others to be the best I can be. I love that you continue to challenge yourself. 
Neville. I mean, you've conquered so many things already in sport, but it seems you're you're on to the next thing and you're thriving in that. So good for you. Sometimes, as we all know, sticking with a goal can be really tough. And, you know, you might encounter some obstacles along the way that derail your progress. But that's why it's important to persevere and keep pushing yourself in order to overcome these obstacles and, and stick to your plan. Remember that goal that's, that's always in sight. It might not be a linear path to accomplishment, but uh, you might have to backtrack a little bit and go side to side. Um, I know the perfect person to tell us a little bit more about perseverance, and that's Priscilla. Priscilla, what are some strategies you use in your own life when you encounter obstacles on the road to, to reaching a goal? Uh, yes, so being able to persevere through those unexpected uh, changes for me is preparation. So prepare for the unexpected. How do you do that? I'm so glad you asked. <laughs> um, I have a plan that when things don't go how I think they're going to go, I change my perspective and I focus on, well, what can I do? Okay, so I broke both of my feet, so I can't train for judo right now at least not standing up, but what can I do? I can focus on my arms. I can focus on uh, recovery. I can put my mind to work. Um, I can strategize. So it's really focusing on what you can do and have a timeline prepared for when you're gonna hopefully be back on track and surrounding myself with the right people who can push me when I need to be pushed and tell me when I need to rest and tell me encouraging words when I need to hear them. So. That's just some of it. <laughs> I love the way you reframe that. So the obstacle, in fact, becomes an opportunity, an opportunity for growth and a chance to adapt and figure out a way to to get to that end goal in a different way that probably strengthens your, your overall repertoire of skill set um, as, as an athlete, but also as a person. So thank you for sharing that. So, uh, as we know, being a champion isn't about being perfect. That just simply doesn't exist, right? We're constantly learning and growing so that we can just become the very best versions of ourselves. So a big part of learning and growing is receiving feedback on how we're doing. And this is not always easy. It's important that we are open to receiving it. Let's call it constructive criticism um, because it really can be helpful for our growth. Uh, this next question is for Josh. How has receiving made you a better athlete? Tessa, you nailed it. It is definitely not always easy to receive constructive criticism or feedback from your coaches or from your friends and from your peers. One of the things that's really helped me in, in absorbing this wisdom that's coming our way, you know, because I think it's understanding that the people that are providing this feedback really care about you and they want to see the best for you. So some of it is just getting out of your own way and allowing that to come at you objectively rather than subjectively and taking it too personally, but also finding a common ground to communicate. Uh, for example, I've got coaches that I really respect, but we don't always agree on things. So we found a way to develop our relationship so that uh, when that feedback's coming, I can take it, I can feel it, I can process it, and then decide how I want to move forward with it. And, and we, we heard uh, Priscilla talk a little bit earlier about perspectives as well. And if we don't have multiple perspectives on what, what we're trying to achieve and our goals, then sometimes we can get lost in it. And I'll give you a quick little example. Uh, from the sport of ski racing, it's really hard to determine what feels good and what's actually fast. And quite often, I feel good and I'm slow. And then the opposite, quite often, I feel really uncomfortable on the racetrack and it's actually really fast. So my perception is not always accurate to what the truth is. So sometimes, even though it's not easy to receive feedback, it's important that we keep an open mind and an open heart to the perspectives that are coming to us. And again, first and foremost, it's developing trust in that relationship with the person that you're allowing to provide you that critical feedback. Such a good answer. You know, who would have thought there would be such similarities between ice dance and torpedoing down a mountain at at um, great speed, but we often, when we felt our best on the ice, it wasn't always perceived as being our best. So I do think it's important to remember um, the voices you're listening to and, and who you're asking feedback from, and also that, you know, 
most likely they're they want you to succeed they want to bolster your self-confidence and your um your ability to be competent in a certain field so it is important to be coachable to be open to that in order for us to learn um i love that uh i think it's time maybe we should check in with some of our schools again and hear some of their questions uh we're gonna head to bear creek elementary out in surrey bc and they have a question for priscilla hi guys Watching you live from your journey. What what did it feel like when you were chosen to represent Canada at the Paralympic Games? Just kidding, just kidding. Great. Great. So the, the question, question for Priscilla was, what did it feel when you were chosen to represent Canada at the Paralympic Games? And what do you hope kids watching you learn from your journey? Uh, to represent Canada at the Paralympic Games, it was monumental for me on multiple levels. The first being because I was always told no as a child with a disability that I could not join any sports teams uh, or even participate in gym class with the other kids. Uh, so to be able to, to represent Canada, my nation, at the Paralympics was m so meaningful for me as, as a childhood dream. Uh, it also was very honoring and a great sense of responsibility because it's not all about me. And uh, it's actually hoping to inspire and encourage young people like yourselves to uh, keep working past the impossibilities or the seemingly impossible and to keep dreaming big and keep believing no matter how it looks. And i that's what I hope that you guys take with you. And, and the message I hope I leave with you is uh, it's never too late, never give up, never listen to, know it's impossible, set your own limits, don't let adults or your friends put limits on you and what you can reach and what you can achieve in your heart. Um, and yeah, that's it. <laughs> Thank you so much. I'm going to be really thinking about that the rest of today and I'm sure that you've inspired many because you've certainly inspired me. Um, great question. Thank you so much. Uh, we have one more for Neville. Take it away. Hi, Neville. I'm Carmen. My question for you is, how do you deal with nerves, pressure, and expectations that come with being in Olympia? Patients, I come with being an Olympian. Um, I realize that you know, as individuals, as humans, we all experience these emotions, nerves, pressure. Uh, the biggest thing um, I find is that you need to embrace it and and live in the moment um, to overcome and and, and keep uh, pushing forward. Uh, for myself, uh, one of the things that I would always do when I compete is that I would trust trust in myself trust uh, in the process and believe that, you know, I, I have the abilities, the skills, the talent to achieve. And uh, one thing I used to do with my one of my teammates is um, we'd always say we don't try, we do. So we don't try and do anything different. We just stick to what we know, what we practice, what we trained at and execute. Love that. Trust yourself and trust the process. That is incredibly powerful. Thank you, Bear Creek Elementary, for those awesome questions. We're gonna head all the way over to Ontario now, my home province, uh, to hear from Miss uh, Sayo's class in New Liskert. The question is for Josh. Hi, Josh. When you set your sights on a goal, does the goal always turn to fall or something like that? That's a great question. Oh, wow. So, uh, how do I describe my goal setting routine? It, it comes in a lot of different ways. Uh, for example, there's there's the cliche saying, uh, it's about the process and not the outcome. And so if we take a step back from that, I look at goals in two ways, qualitative and quantitative. Hmm, qualitative. 
that's the quality of the experience. How does that make me feel? How does that make others around me that are part of that experience with me? How does that make them feel? Does it elevate them or is it even keel or does it do something else? Quantitative is very easy. It's, it's a measurement. How fast do I want to go? What position would I like to be in? And I have to always hold these two in balance. Uh, the process is very important. Uh, the outcome in, in some people's minds is important and for sure in a sport where we're measured, uh, we, we definitely want to achieve certain successes. But I just want to flip this one on its head for a second too because we want to talk about how do we adjust and accommodate to our goals and do they shift over time? If we look back at my story, uh, once upon a time I was a freestyle skier and I wanted to be just like Jean-Luc Broussard, the great Olympic mogul skier from Quebec. And not only Olympic skier, but Olympic champion. And uh, my dreams were set on that. And I always wanted to be an Olympic skier. When I was 23, I sustained a spinal cord injury that left me paralyzed from the waist down. And if I was so fixed on that goal to be the best Olympic skier ever, perhaps I would have never taken up skiing again. And who knows where my life would have gone. Uh, rather, I just shifted that goal a little bit and said, hey, I want to be a skier and I want to do that for Canada. And so then I just reorientated the ship just a little bit. That allowed me to get back on the path and pursue a new goal. And for anybody who knows skiing, there is a fair uh, cultural difference between alpine and freestyle. But then having an opportunity to participate in both, I saw the similarities, the opportunities. I took what I once knew from that previous pathway and reapplied it. And uh, I'm so fortunate to have had that experience with goal setting and how they can shift. And we need to listen as much as we need to drive. Josh, throughout that experience for you, did you ever consider giving up or never returning to the ski hill? Tessa, that's a great follow-up question. Uh, no, I didn't. And it was the wisdom of the doctor in the emergency room right after I had broken my back, literally hours after I had broken my back, and he gave me this. He says, Josh, you're going to rock the world from a wheelchair. And before you know it, we're going to have you back in the mountains, riding a sit ski with all your friends. And, and I've, I've mentioned a few times that it was so important for me to be a part of community, uh, to I love the outdoors. I, I love playing outside. And then sport has been a large part of my identity. So, no, actually, I never, I never lost that. I didn't know I would be competitive in it. I thought I would just be a recreational skier. But uh, we live with great fortune being Canadians and having all of these incredible opportunities for athletes of all walks of life. Well, you did indeed rock the world. <laughs> uh, this next question is for Evan. Hi, Evan. I'm Fire Wu, and this is our question. Sometimes, when faced with a challenge or a new experience, a person may feel overwhelmed or choose not to, or choose to not continue in genuine fear. Do you have advice on how to face challenges or mistakes in order to push through and accomplish your goals? Uh, awesome, thanks for that. So, so the question is asking, uh, my advice on you know, how I face challenges uh, and how I, I you know, take those challenges and push through and, and really you know, continue to work towards and accomplishing my goals. And uh, you know, challenges are something that, that everyone faces and, and you know, Neville and Priscilla and Josh have all talked about it already, uh, about goals being about the process and not about the outcome. Uh, you know, my challenges are very diff. My challenges in my sporting career have been very different from, you know, say the challenges Josh has faced. I wasn't lying in a hospital bed with a broken, uh, broken back, uh, being told that you know I was going to ski again by the doctors. My my challenge was standing on the sidelines of the 2012 Olympic Games, crying watching my teammates compete because I wasn't competing and that was what I had dreamed of doing and and you know seeing them accomplish that goal was just so inspiring to me that I you know was sad I wasn't a part of it and you know I think all of our the thing all of our challenges have in common uh, is that the journey isn't linear you know we don't follow this straight line path from where we are today to where we want to go uh, and you know in any pursuit of a goal there's going to be ups and downs and and for me personally, like I view my challenges as just an opportunity to really reconfirm how much I want that goal. You know, I look at a challenge and I'll take a step back and I'll say, okay, you know, what was that challenge? What was that stumbling block? 
do I really still love this? Do I really still want to achieve these goals? You know, I have really big goals. I want to win Olympic gold medals and, and break world records. And, uh, and so I'll ask myself, is this still what I really, really want to do? And you know, 100% of the time so far, the answer has been yes. So then I look and say, okay, well, how can I, you know, what can I do today to get back on track? What can I do tomorrow to get back on track? And it's really about just asking yourself every day, okay, you know, how can I work towards that goal today? And some days you'll take a step back, but as long as you're consistently working towards that goal, you'll get back on the right track and you'll get back towards achieving those goals. And those challenges are little blips, but they definitely make us stronger along the way as well. And um, you know, the last thing I would say to that is that all, all the stuff that I've learned through sport, which is so much, has been learned through those challenges, through facing that adversity and coming out the other end. That's where we really learn the most. So, you know, face those challenges head on and, and really embrace them. Thank you, Evan. I think that is, it's great to hear your perspective on how that setback in 2012 led you to forge ahead and dream even bigger and, and set your sights higher. Yeah, I think there was the word fear mentioned in there and something about facing them. And I remember one of the things that my sports psychologist taught me, it's an acronym for fear, F-E-A-R, face everything and rise. And I use that as a mantra often when I took the ice and I was feeling fearful because everyone gets scared and everyone feels stressed and feels the pressure. And it's frightening sometimes. Um, but that notion of facing everything and rising really was... Um, helpful to me. Maybe it will help you too. <laughs> so thanks to Ms. Sayo's class for those questions. So thoughtful, um, really intuitive. Thank you for, for those. Um, we also have some questions that have been submitted by teachers through the, the teacher dashboard. So let's take one of those now. And this one is uh, for Josh. What do you do to feel 100% ready for a competition? I don't know if there's anything like a hundred percent confident i've i've never i don't know if that's possible to be a hundred percent confident what what i can say and i bet the teachers are going to like the answers for this one is we need to do our homework we need to come into any challenge prepared for it uh, competition is is really like one of the ultimate tests it's a moment where you are exposed to the world your community your class your friends and everything that you've done to prepare for that is going to be shared with, with those that are around you, those that are um, bearing witness to that experience for you. And if I was to let you into that experience at the, uh, the Paralympics for myself, um, you're in the start and there's so much energy, there's so much hype. And I wish I had that advice from Tessa about managing fear because that's a great one. Um, your mind is moving quickly. And your, your, at least for me, in my natural state, there was uh, going to be moments of self-doubt. Am I good enough? Do I deserve this? Uh, have I done all the work? And what was really helpful for me in those moments of intense pressure was to go through the list of, yeah, I am worthy and I do deserve this. And I have done my homework. So by homework for me is like, did I put in the volume of training that I needed to did I listen to my coaches and follow that direction? Did I honor the pathway? And if I have, that means all of those things just fall away and it, it gives you this really unique opportunity to surrender to the moment. And it's no longer about the outcome. It's almost like the competition itself becomes the reward for all the effort. And we've heard Tessa and all the other athletes talk about uh, the joy really is in the journey and the outcome will to a degree resolve itself. When I say that, I mean like you still have to put in a good effort and show up and be present, but it's just so key to do the work beforehand in order to feel prepared for the moment. Because when that moment presents itself and it's a beautiful experience, I, and I hope you all have a chance to have that at some point in your life, whether it's recreational and or arts or whatever it might be, but like put in the work. And as my dad once told me, the reward is intrinsic to the effort. If you put in a great effort, then you'll have nothing to worry about when it comes time to shine. Well said by, by your dad, and thank you for sharing that. As I'm listening to that answer, I'm struck by the fact that when faced with pressure 
and stress, isn't it interesting as humans that we question our worth or we question whether we deserve to be there? I think that's only natural, but to combat that with some assurances and reminders of the preparation we've done and um, of our of our competency levels, of our skills, and of the people who are supporting us. That can be incredibly helpful in those moments of doubt. Sometimes you just need to quiet the noise. Your, your brain wants to ask questions, and uh, sometimes you just need to give it an answer. <laughs> so thank you so much. We're going to go back west to Calgary to Marianne Carson School again to hear their question, their second question. And uh, this one's for Neville. Go ahead. Hi, Neville. I'm Lila. We've been learning about what it means to be a good citizen. How does being an Olympic athlete inspire you to help your community? Um, being an Olympic athlete has actually provided me the opportunity and the platform to be able to engage and speak with others. Um, I was that, uh, you know, growing up, I was that kid that, you know, went through personal struggles, you know, had financial hardships, dealt with bullying, dealt with issues of confidence. And um, through the, through that process, you know, I, I was able to develop, learn, grow, and become more resilient and stronger. And now it's given me the opportunity to be able to speak to youth such as you, to be able to encourage you and to let you know that you can overcome anything and, uh, and um, you can beat the odds. Um, I was that one child as well that, you know, struggled with, for example, with a speech impediment and I couldn't articulate myself properly. And, and, you know, refusing to give up, you know, I, I taught myself and learned how to speak properly so I could actually engage with others. So um, I'm able to now be able to reach out to others and really encourage them and, and let them know that you can achieve anything, you know, believe in yourself, work hard and never give up on yourself. Thank you, Neville. And um, thank you to Marion Carson School. I hope you hear that. You never give up on yourself because you are capable of anything you want to do. All of you are watching this. All of you are tuning in. So thank you to the grade three class for those questions. We truly appreciate it. Um, I think we have time for a couple more questions. Uh, we have a few more that have been submitted by teachers using the, the teacher dashboard. So this first question is from Ms. Boulanger's class at a Cole Rochester in Coquitlam, BC. Evan and Priscilla, we're coming over to you. And I'm going to ask, what inspired you to take up your respective sports? Priscilla, shall we? Sure. So for me, I love combat and vision impaired. So can't really block a kick or a punch in karate. So that left me with wrestling. But wrestling wasn't in the Paralympics. Thus, I became a judo player and fell hard in love with it. Yeah, um, you know, growing up, I was the, the shortest kid in the class. I have uh, the, the red curly hair and, and I had these big, thick glasses. And, you know, I was kind of that quintessential kid who was you know, picked on and, and, and bullied a little bit in school. And I loved sports so much. And, and for me, sport was going to be the thing that I was going to prove to everyone else that you know, I could be the best at something. I was going to, you know, just whatever it was, I was going to do something. And when I was nine years old, I, I wrote on my grade three, what do you want to be when you grow up assignment? I wrote, I want to go to the Olympic Games. And I remember my teacher was kind of like, oh, it's really nice. Like, do you want to add something else in there? And I was like, nope, Olympics. That's what I'm going to do. And you know, I didn't know necessarily what that sport was going to be. And you know, uh, unlike Priscilla, I wasn't uh, you know, great at combat. So I chose to, to run away instead. Um, I learned how to, you know, I found out that I was really good at running for long periods of time with, you know, without stopping. And uh, unlike, um, you know, unlike all the ball sports, I wasn't getting hit in the face and I wasn't breaking my glasses. So uh, it was really fun to do that, succeed at something. And I, I kind of fell into this race walking thing by complete accident. Um, but after my first race, my coach, who's still my coach today, um, 20 years later, he's still my coach sort of saw that I had some some fun doing this race walking race and I had won the race and, and he asked me if he if I want to keep doing it and yeah I said yeah I want I want to be good at something and I, I you know I won this race so let's keep trying to, to do this and 
you know, that was really my motivation when I when I first started was just I wanted to find the thing that I could make my own and 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 really come into my own in. And I'm I'm so grateful for you know that kind of serendipitous opportunity to just try this thing out and and see where it's taken my life. And I'm so grateful. That collaboration and partnership with your coach over such an extended period of time, I'm sure that that longevity would add to your success, but also your comfort level in knowing that you have someone in your corner constantly who is um, pushing you to be the best, but, but also doing so with a full understanding of how you operate, what motivates you, what makes you tick, um, what inspires you. And I, I'm sure that, that that is a really significant and meaningful relationship in your life. Josh, I'm, I'm curious, um, we have kids, students from ages six to 13 tuning in here today, and I wonder what might 10-year-old Josh um, have benefited from knowing? What do you wish you could go back and, and tell your younger self? Oh, that is a, such a good question, Tessa. Uh, give me a moment. What would 10-year-old self benefit from this? Uh, be kind and be gentle, not only with one another, but with yourself. I remember, not too different than Evan, uh, I struggled to fit in. And because of that, I really believed what the naysayers and the bullies were saying about me. And I actually allowed that to become my identity. And I believed the mean things that they said to me. And from there, I kind of allowed myself to believe that I wasn't worthy and I wasn't good enough and I let those voices develop my insecurities. What I'm learning here today is that we're so much more than that. And I would uh, take from today and, and encourage you to take from today as well that it's so important, and we're hearing it from all of the athletes, to find what you're passionate about, find what you care about, find what makes your heart sing and dance, and put all of your energy and all of your force into that and, and in a way that makes the world around you better. And, and I'll leave you with this. If we can live a life where we give more than we take, then that's a life well lived. And if we can do that while having a whole lot of fun, well, that's going to elevate everybody else around us. Thank you for sharing that, Josh. I think it gives us a lot to think about. And, and so often this message has become today about um, the sense of sharing you know, it can be isolating often when you're in pursuit of something. I think it can ostracize you and you can feel alone sometimes. But remembering that there's, it's bigger than, than just you and, and you have an ability to create a certain environment around you to, to lift others up, to boost someone else's self-esteem, to create a team um, reliant on one another. I think that can really serve us and, and add to our sense of self-worth. Um, thank you. This next question comes from Thunder Bay, Ontario. Miss Sutherland's class at St. Thomas Aquinas School, uh, and they have a question for me. And they're asking, do you have a ritual that you do before you figure skate uh, for that extra good luck element that helps you mentally? How long do we have here? <laughs> because I used to be very superstitious, but um, Scott and I, my skating partner, and I had many, many rituals to ensure that we were on the same page. We were a team of two and we skated together for 22 years. So we knew each other really, really well. But in order to be our best on the ice, we needed to be completely in sync and in unison. So one of the things we like to do was synchronize our breathing. So we would hug and breathe at the same time. We, we joked that we wanted our hearts to beat at the same time. We wanted to be blinking at the same time. Um, but I found that really reassuring, really comforting. Another thing that we did together, we um, before taking the ice, we would talk about the preparation we had done. And we would utilize these keywords, these reminders of all of the training we did leading up to that one moment that reminded us we're ready, we're unstoppable. We can take on this challenge because we've prepared for it. And Evan spoke about preparation so eloquently. I think that is key to confidence. And Finally, we would just squeeze, squeeze each other's hands. We would look at each other and often there was a wink involved and we would just say, I'm with you. You know, there was something really powerful about not feeling alone. And 
that served us really well in those pressure filled situations when um, we were trying to represent Canada the, to the best of our ability. But uh, those were my few little rituals for a while. I had some where my guards at the boards and water ball and everything. And I tried to ditch that because um, it needed to be about what I was doing on the ice. <laughs> so thank you for that question. I really appreciate it. Um, to all of our athletes and listeners, I would like to say thank you. Thank you for taking the time. Thank you for sharing your thoughts, which we want to hear more of, by the way. Um, to the athletes, Evan, Priscilla, Neville, and Josh, I I'm so inspired and invigorated by these chats. I think there are so many takeaways that um, we can all carry into our everyday lives about what it means to, to really be a champion. And um, valuable lessons in goal setting, perseverance, um, receiving feedback, and, and how we can open ourselves up to, to take that leap to be the best versions of ourselves. Um, as we say goodbye, I would like to let this chat percolate, let it digest, and I would like to challenge you. I would like to think about, I would like to ask you to think about what the attitude of a champion really means. And I would like to, to challenge you to Encourage those around you, your peers, your colleagues, to be champions as well. And maybe the teachers can can share with us. You can have a, a class discussion and and use that social media hashtag, be a champion, and, and let us know what you think. How can we lift others up around us? And how can we step into um, this next chapter, whatever it may be, and, and really own that attitude of being a champion? How do we equip ourselves with the tools to live our best lives and, and encourage others to do the same. So remember that the fun doesn't end here, uh, although this was so much fun. <laughs> we will have more incredible lesson plans uh, coming to gear us up for the next champion chat happening in May. So stay tuned to the Team Canada Champion Chats excitement. And I would like to say a heartfelt thank you to our athletes. We're all gonna sign off and wish you an incredible afternoon, a really great evening and uh, until next time my friends <laughs>